This diagram was super important to us. Do you remember? We concluded um, using some fancy uh, use of De Marvis theorem and polar form that if you are taking the roots of a complex number, wherever it happens to be on the complex plane, and this is um, this is the complex plane. Then the result, all of the roots of that complex number that you get, you find them arranged on the circumference of a circle. Do you remember this idea? Right. So for example, um, if I said to you, uh, what was the one we looked at? We looked at like the sixth roots and the fifth roots, I think, of particular kinds of numbers, right? So for example, if I have if I have one, right, and by the way, we said one had a special number. Do you remember what the uh, sorry, a special name rather? What was the special name of one? We call it unity. So here's unity, here's the origin, right? If you wanted to take, say, for example, the seventh roots of unity, okay? The first thing I want to ask is, how many seventh roots are there of unity? There are seven, precisely seven. And we said that that has, a, um, that has an important uh, idea that comes along with it, the fundamental theorem of algebra, that if you've got a polynomial and its degree is seven, you're going to get exactly seven complex solutions. Now, where would they be if this was the unit circle? Okay, let's not label it just yet because I don't want to um, don't want to make this too busy. If this were the unit circle, where are these seven? How would you describe where these seven roots are going to be? Where's the first one? Where's the first most obvious one? It's going to be at unity, right? Because unity is its own seventh root, eighth root, etc. So I'm going to have one there. Okay. Where are the rest of the roots going to be? How would you verbally describe them? Like without pointing and saying. Say again. Negative one. Is there going to be one over here? What do you reckon? Now it's interesting. Negative one is frequently one of the roots of unity, but only half the time. Okay, think about it. Negative one is one of the square roots of unity. Okay, but it's not one of the cube roots of unity. Do you remember what the cube roots of unity look like? Do you remember where they are? Because when I start to position them around the circumference, what was the, um, like are they all going to be like over here? Or are they going to be down here? There's a particular geometric quality that they had that helps us understand where they are in relation to each other. Session. What was it? 2 pi on 3? Okay, they're going to be, in the, in the case of cube roots, yeah. they're going to be uh, 2 pi on 3 around this way, and then another 2 pi on 3, and then another 2 pi on 3 to get you back. Okay. That was in the case of cube roots. Obviously, seventh roots are not going to be 2 pi on 3 apart. How far are they going to be apart? Yeah, 2 pi on 7. 2 pi on 7, right? Because you're going to need to space out 7 of them, right? And they are going to be, here's the phrase I want you to remember, they want to be equally spaced. Do you recall that? Okay. So, for example, here's one of the nice things about it. Actually, you know what? Let's try. Um, if you were to put 7 on here, okay, what shape is that going to trace out? It's going to trace out a heptagon if you were to go all the way around. Okay. Now, uh, 2 pi on 7, let's just jot this down. 2 pi on 7, it's, it's a bit hard for us to grapple with this idea because we've been so used to living in the degrees world. How many degrees is 2 pi on 7? Has someone got like a calculator there? Someone want to get at a number that's close? Say how many degrees? 51 degrees. We'll go with 51. That'll be close enough. Okay. So 51 degrees, that's a bad degree, so you get the idea. Can we just generally put on to there? I mean, you can see if that's 90, then 45 is going to be here. 45 is quite easy to spot visually. So I'm guessing 51 is just a little bit extra. Yeah, do you agree with that? So let's put that all on there. Okay, so if we call that 51 degrees, the next one's going to be at 102 degrees-ish, right? So 102, here's 90. Right, so 102 is going to be just past that. Do you agree with that? Okay, can you put these on with me? Can you put the other, we've got three already, can you put the other four? It's okay, you don't have to use a protractor or anything like that. That's a 
Okay, I, I've done my best. Okay. Now, the first thing you can see, if you've got another colour there, you can actually kind of visualise the heptagon. Do you see where it is? Right, there it goes. Sort of going all the way around. Okay. So another way you could describe this is that you're going to trace out the, uh, the nth roots of a complex number are going to trace out a regular n-gon. N-gon? Like a regular pentagon, regular heptagon, regular hexagon, whatever. Okay, this is an, this is an n-gon, right? Uh, that's actually, I'm not just making that up, by the way. An n-gon, that's what it's called. Um, now, you can see that there. Now, I want you to notice something else about these, um, these roots. Do you see, because of the way we have spaced them out, if I, ha if I give these roots some names, okay, and um, I'm going to call this one Z1, Z2, all the way around. Not only are they evenly spaced from adjacent roots as you go around, right? Do you notice they kind of come in pairs? Do, do you notice that? Um, there's like this guy just hanging out on his own, but every other one, and you may want to draw this on, Every other one is paired up, right? For example, Z2 is paired up with Z7. Z3 is paired up with Z6. And Z4 is paired up with Z5. When I put them in those pairs, what's the relationship between those pairs? They're complex conjugates, aren't they, right? So for example, and this is what I'd like you to draw on here, right? You can draw a dotted line down here, and you can see this is X plus IY and X minus IY. Do, do you see it? Uh, in the same way, x plus iy, x, let's draw this vertical line, minus iy, and in the same way, uh, x plus iy and x minus iy, right? So you've got these conjugate pairs in there. That's kind of cool. Um, another way you can think about conjugate pairs is not just in rectangular form. We know that these guys, these guys are how you would write conjugate pairs in, um, in rectangular form. How do you write conjugate pairs in polar form? Do you remember? I'll give you a clue. We know that polar form starts like that, right? But what you've got here is a pair and you're going to rotate to two different spots, right? So in fact, to try and put both of these together, right? I'm going to have one which goes in the anti-clockwise direction. That's the normally the direction I measure in. So there goes plus theta. To go plus theta to go up to Z2, Right? Like, let's just put theta in there. How do I, what angle do I rotate through to get to the conjugate pair? Yeah, I'm going to go down here to negative theta, because I'm going in the clockwise direction. Do you see that? So this is going to be plus minus theta, and you've got I sine of plus minus theta. Okay? So this is the way you write conjugate pairs in rectangular form. This is the way you write them in polar form. Okay, oh, quickly, by the way, you notice the x's, the real part, they should be the same number, right? Because, of course, cos theta and cos negative theta, think about what kind of function is cos. It's, a, it's an even function, right? It's symmetrical about the, x, the y axis. So, therefore, cos theta, cos negative theta, they're the same number. Yeah, are you with me? Okay. Now, this is what we focused on last time. Um, I will just quickly mention a name for you because as, as I've been mentioning names, names are important, names give you power in understanding and manipulating concepts. How you just notice that these come up in pairs, okay? It actually has a name, this idea. Um, we're not going to deal with it formally now because you really need all the bits and pieces of polynomials, which you've only done a little bit of. But this is called the complex conjugate root theorem. The complex conjugate root theorem states, you don't need to worry about getting this formal definition now, but I want you to hear it, is that all of these, we could say, they're the seventh roots of unity, right? The seventh roots of unity. The seventh roots of unity are all the solutions to a particular polynomial. What polynomial are they the solutions to? What polynomial could I write such that if you solved it, you'd get these seven? What would it be? Hmm. I'm going to go with z, but that's, that's fine. z to the power of 7 should equal 1, right? Because the whole point of being a 7th root 
right? Is that if you raise it to the power of seven, you should get one. Do, do you agree with that? So the polynomial that this corresponds to is this guy, this polynomial here, okay? Now, in fact, if you write any polynomial you like, right? So long as these coefficients are real, the coefficients are one and negative one in this case, and a whole bunch of zeros in between. I don't have any z to the six, no z to the five, etc. But so long as all coefficients are real, then every single solution you get will have a pair. It will always have a pair like this, okay? And the pair will be complex conjugates, okay? In fact, you already knew this. You already knew this. Think about, um, think about your quadratics, right? You know how we started looking at quadratics? That's how we introduced in imaginary numbers. When you have a look at a quadratic which isn't supposed to have roots, right? Um, like x squared plus x, if I do b squared roots, plus 1. <coughs> That has no real roots, okay? But all the coefficients are real. So therefore, the solutions to these guys, whatever they happen to be, they're going to be complex conjugates of one another. There's a really fancy proof for it, but that will have to wait for another time. Okay?